Thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and welcome to another episode of Ninjago Retold, the show where I tell the entire story of LEGO Ninjago's 11-year run from the beginning to the end in chronological order. Previously, we discussed the prologue and chapter one of the story, and now it's time to delve into pretty much the main plot of the full seasons of the show, chapter two, Rise of the Serpentine. And without further ado, let's just jump right into the episode. Previously on Ninjago Retold, Siege of the Skulkin. After years banished in the darkness of the underworld, Lord Garmadon strikes back, sending forth ghoulish warriors on a mission to reclaim the golden weapons of Spinjitsu, artifacts with the ability to reshape the land of Ninjago itself in his own dark image. With the old alliance of elemental masters long disbanded and the realm in desperate need of new heroes, Master Wu recruits four young ninja, sons of legendary warriors in the past, to battle the darkness of his brother Garmadon. Training at the Monastery of Spinjitsu, Kai, Jay, Zane, and Cole manage to rescue Kai's sister Nia, claim the golden weapons, and descend into the underworld itself, only for Garmadon to make his escape to the realm of madness. Now, it is up to these four ninja to prepare for the Dark Lord's eventual return, and grapple with the sins of the past, with the shadow of the ancient Serpentine Wars once again threatening Ninjago. This is Ninjago Retold. You're a long way from finding a ninja in these parts, old man. Lloyd is the green ninja. I am the ultimate spinjitsu master! Support me, friends, for one last time. The new Serpentine War has just begun. My master has arrived. Guess it's true. The greatest love stories do always end in tragedy. Maybe I'm departed. Control time. Control everything. I have no son. I cannot fight you, but I can resist you. Endings will always come. All we can do is fight to make them good ones. Revenge! Except those who cannot protect themselves. You were programmed by the game to lose, but you don't have to. I want you to promise me that you will always stand up to those who are cruel. We are the keepers of the amulet. I am. I am the same. We are one. There will be peace in the dark. Episode 2, Rise of the Serpentine Chapter 1, A Prophesied Savior It was a new day in the realm of Ninjago. The darkness of the Skulkin and legions of the underworld had been pushed back by the brave new ninja warriors, and for a brief time, Ninjago found itself once again at peace. In these rare months without conflict, our four heroes, Kai, Jay, Zane, and Cole, continued to train at the monastery, bonding with each other and their sensei as they honed their skills of spinjitsu and dragon riding. Building a dragon keep into the side of the mountain itself, the four ninja raced through the skies on their majestic dragons, speeding through the forest of tranquility and mastering dragon flight as the days grew on. As the ninja bonded, Jay grew particularly close to Kai's sister Nia, with the pair flying on the lightning dragon together across the realm of Ninjago. Not wanting to be left out, Nia began honing her own unique style of fighting as she watched her brother and her friends train, preparing for a time where she could one day protect the realm, just as her parents did in the Serpentine Wars. In the darkness of the underworld, despite Garmadon's absence, the Skulkin grew restless, sending small incursions into the realm of Ninjago to take their revenge on the ninja. Discovering the secret passageway connecting both realms in the Fire Temple, Skulkin General Whiplash, who had seized power in the wake of Samakai and Garmadon's disappearance, led a convoy of skeleton warriors up to the realm of Ninjago. Making his way to the village of Ignatia, Whiplash snuck into the Four Weapons blacksmith shop, lying in wait for Nia or the ninja to return. But he would soon find that Nia was a formidable force on her own, 
and as Nia returned to her former home to gather her belongings to move into the monastery, she was ambushed by Whiplash and his soldiers. Fighting off four Skulkin at once while an oblivious Jay waited outside, Nia managed to beat back the Skulkin general and his hunchmen, forcing the warriors to retreat to the Fire Temple. But the Skulkin incursion would not last long. For days later, the Fire Dragon alerted Kai and Nia to this dark presence in the temple. Despite Kai being captured and losing his sword, Nia swooped in to rescue her brother, collapsing the inter-realm portal entrance and ending the threat of General Whiplash. Others, like Generals Cruncha and Knuckle, snuck back into the realm via their own means, commandeering the Skulkin monster truck to rip a portal open between realms at immense speed, hurtling towards the Monastery of Spinjitsu as they made a play for the Golden Weapons. But as these Skulkins seized the weapons, the power overwhelmed them, and from that day on, Cruncha and Knuckle abandoned their quest for the weapons, choosing instead to live in the realm of Ninjago long term. And with the threat of the Skulkin ended for good, Days turned to months, and the ninja continued to train with no sign of evil afoot. Unaware of the many threats lurking just beyond their reach, the ninja grew tired of their endless training, slowly growing lazy and complacent, wasting the potential of their golden weapons, and spending more and more time in the monastery playing games and relaxing. As this time of peace stretched on, famous explorer Clutch Powers, who in his glory days had led expeditions to far-off lands like Chintaro and desolate serpentine tubes, finally retired instead writing books that chronicled his adventures in exaggerated tales. Over his time as an adventurer, Clutch Powers managed to uncover dozens of ancient artifacts for his esteemed Explorer's Club, such as a scroll of forbidden spinjitsu, relic of the first spinjitsu master from decades ago, and even a fang blade, tooth of the legendary Great Devourer, serpentine god who was destined to one day devour the entire realm of Ninjago. It was in this time of tranquility that Lloyd Montgomery Garmadon, son of Misako and Lord Garmadon, was studying at Darkly's boarding school for bad boys, estranged from both his parents. Sent there by his mother Misako in the hopes of preventing a battle between father and son, Lloyd had grown bitter and resentful of Misako, and yearned to be more like his father, the Dark Lord of Shadows, who he grew to idolize. But despite his attempts, Lloyd was kicked out of Darkly's, his teachers believing that he didn't have the potential to one day rule the realm. And so, seeking revenge against Ninjago and looking to prove his teachers wrong and follow in his father's footsteps, Lloyd donned a dark robe, drew oni-like rib cages on his clothing, and made his way to the isolated village of Jamanakai, where he hoped to terrorize the civilians by posing as his father returned from the underworld. Just as Lloyd arrived in Jamanakai and announced his presence as Lord Garmadon, Wu was in the middle of berating the young ninja for wasting their potential and refusing to train when alarm bells sounded, Nia rushing in to inform them that their nemesis, Garmadon, had been spotted at the village. Stumbling over their weapons and rushing to their dragon pens, the four ninja were out of practice, out of shape, and unprepared for any threat. But even still, they scrambled to the village to do battle with what they believed to be Lord Garmadon. And so, in Jamanakai Village, a climactic meeting was about to take place between the four ninja and Lloyd Garmadon, son of the Dark Lord. But when the ninja arrived on the scene, they were surprised to find that the threat was not, in fact, Lord Garmadon, but his son Lloyd, doing his best to mimic his father as a mere child. Realizing there was no threat, the villagers came forth from their homes, helping the ninja string up Lloyd from the rooftops as punishment for threatening the townspeople, who was more irate than ever, swearing to unleash the fabled Serpentine upon the lands, as they once terrorized the realm during the Serpentine Wars of old. But as the ninja were celebrating and preparing to return to the monastery, an ancient scroll fell from their bags, for in their haste, they had accidentally grabbed Master Wu's satchel, and not their own. And on this ancient text, the most important prophecy across the realm of Ninjago was outlined. The legend of the Green Ninja. Foretelling a savior who would one day rise above the others and become the most powerful Spinjitsu master in the realm, the scroll outlined this Green Ninja's destiny to defeat the ultimate source of evil and bring peace to the realm. Convinced the scroll was referring to Garmadon as the source of evil, and that the legendary Green Ninja was one of them, Kai, Jay, Zane, and Cole were renewed with a new source of motivation, blasting back to the monastery to train harder and more intensely than ever, in about to determine who would be the Green Ninja. 
Encountering Nia attempting to run the training course herself, the four ninja asked her to use the training grounds, equipping kendo training armor and wielding the awesome power of their golden weapons to battle in a tournament against each other. One by one, each ninja battled the next as they vied for the title of Green Ninja, still unaware of the true power their weapons possessed. And in a climactic battle between Kai and Cole, the Ninja of Fire lost control of his weapon, blasting waves of flame and heat all over the monastery. Just when all seemed lost, Wu rushed out and seized the Shurikens of Ice, summoning a cooling whirlwind of ice and snow to quench the flames, and berating his pupils for rushing destiny. Forcing the ninja to promise to continue along their training path before any further talk of the Green Ninja prophecy, Wu told the ninja of the power of their true potential, the ultimate force an elemental master could unlock upon mastery of their element, just as Cole's mother Lily had unlocked decades ago. Chapter 2, Tombs of the Serpentine And as the ninja trained and rehoned their skills and weapons at the monastery, Lloyd found himself cast out from Jamonikai, alone and vengeful against the ninja who humiliated him and his schemes. Making his way up the mountain to the frozen wastelands of Ninjago, the young villain-to-be stumbled upon an ancient serpentine sculpture frozen in ice, binding tomb of the Hypnobri tribe. Decades ago, after the conclusion of the Great Serpentine Wars and construction of the Sacred Flutes, the Elemental Alliance sealed away each of the five Serpentine tribes in separate tombs, with the mesmerizing force of the Hypnobri Serpent sealed away in the snowy mountains. Inadvertently triggering the opening mechanism of the tomb, Lloyd found the very ground beneath him start to open up. As the snow cleared, the menacing emblem of the Hypnobri revealed itself, carved directly into solid rock and battered by the elements. Before he had a chance to react, Lloyd found himself sliding into an icy crypt, sealed for years after the Serpentine Wars. Stumbling into an ominous cave of ice, he came face to face with Slithra, Hypnobri General from ages ago, who immediately prepared to use his hypnotic power to keep the young Lloyd in his way, and use him to free the rest of his tribe and the other serpents. But in a twist of fate, Lloyd lunged out of the way at the last moment, leaving Slithra reflecting his own hypnosis back at him. And just like that, Lloyd became leader of the fearsome Hypnobri tribe, who began to slither into the light from the darkness of the tomb. Making short work to free the Hypnobri, Lloyd led his new army of serpents back down the slopes to Jamonikai village, hypnotizing the villagers under their sway. As he forced the townspeople to cater to his every whim, fetching him hordes of candy and treating him like a king, word of his return reached the ninja, who are now back in fighting shape to deal with the threat. Striking from the monastery, the four ninja hurtled to the village on their dragons, engaging the Serpentine in a rapid skirmish and seizing the Hypnobri staff from Slithra, the only source of an antidote to the hypnotic sway of the snakes. But in the tussle, the crafty Serpentine Scales, second in command to Slithra, managed to catch Cole unawares, hypnotizing him under his direct command. And so, unbeknownst to the rest of the ninja, Scales began to watch them through Cole's eyes, probing the team for weaknesses and seeking to take his place as leader of the Hypnobri. Back in the darkness of the Hypnobri tomb, which was now being used as a base of operations for the serpents, Scales plotted with Mesmo, another Hypnobri warrior, expressing his lack of confidence in their leader Slithra, who was clearly under the sway of a mere child. Together, Scales, Mesmo, and others began to spread doubt throughout the Hypnobi tribe of their leader, sowing the seeds for a future takeover of the mantle of Tribe General. Back at the monastery, the ninja were reeling from the revelation that the Serpentine had escaped their tombs, and while life continued, the threat of the Serpentine was now ever-present. As they continued to train harder and harder, Kai, Jay, and Cole began to grow tired of Zane's quirks and inability to understand social cues, with incidents as severe as his shurikens of ice coating the entire monastery in snow, or as banal as him interrupting Jay and Nia's date night to watch the movie with them, occurring at increasing frequency. And as the mailman ascended the steps to the monastery to deliver their mail, the ninja wondered why Zane never got any mail of his own, and never heard a word from his family. Meanwhile, deep in the Forest of Tranquility, Lloyd sent the Hypnobri warriors on his next mission to construct the greatest treehouse in all the realm as hideout and play fortress to live in. 
While scales continued to sow dissent among the Hypnobri ranks, the serpents had no choice but to follow the orders of their leader, Slithra, who remained entranced under Lloyd's hypnosis. And so, over the course of weeks, the Serpentine erected a massive yet fragile tree fortress for their child ruler, scales lamenting the proceedings the entire time, as snakes do not belong in trees. Over this time, the ninja continued to bond as a team, and yet Zane remained the odd one out. While Jay and Nia grew closer and closer, Cole formed a strong bond with Jay, and even Kai managed to relax and let down his guard around his team. Zane struggled to connect with his companions, and when his friends and even Master Wu engaged in a food fight, he wandered off from the monastery, sitting outside in solitude. It was then that Zane encountered a mysterious falcon, perched atop the monastery's tree. This falcon seemed to watch his every move, and even attempt to communicate with the young nindroid. Little did Zane know, but this falcon was his original robotic companion. Built by the tinkerer, Dr. Julian, the falcon had been constructed years ago to serve as Zane's eyes from above and even be a form of pet. But with his nindroid memory wiped, all traces of Zane's former bond with the falcon had disappeared. Following the mysterious bird through the treetops of the Forest of Tranquility, Zane came across the massive Hypnobri treehouse, spotting Lloyd leading the blue-skinned snakes atop the ramshackle wooden lair. Quickly rushing back to warn the rest of his team, Zane convinced the rest of the ninja to follow him into the forest at first light, and while the others were initially skeptical of the source of his information being a bird, they realized that Zane was right, and they had discovered the hiding place of Lloyd and the Hypnobri. Engaging the serpents in yet another battle, the ninja leapt into action, seeking to topple the tree fortress and send the serpentine plunging to the ground. Just as they were gaining the upper hand, Scales activated the latent hypnotic power he had burrowed into Cole's mind, and the ninja of Earth turned against his comrades, lunging at them with his scythe of quakes and threatening to collapse the entire treehouse. Just when all seemed lost and Cole had gained the upper hand, Wu and Nia came soaring in on the fire dragon, playing Wu's ancient sacred flute, old weapon the elemental masters had used decades ago to seal the serpentine in their tombs. With Cole broken free of his hypnosis, the six heroes used the rest of their powers to destroy the treehouse and return to the monastery victorious, only to find that in their absence, the serpentine had lit their home ablaze destroying the once beautiful monastery of the first Spinjitsu Master and reclaiming the Hypnobri Snake Staff in the process. Devastated, Wu could only watch as his childhood home was destroyed before his eyes, and an icon of peace and justice in Ninjago was lost forever. In their anger, Kai, Jay, and Cole turned against Zane, blaming him for forcing them to leave the monastery unprotected and lashing out against their teammate. But as Sensei Wu reprimanded the three ninja for blaming their friend, Zane took flight on his ice dragon for reasons unknown, leaving the group behind. Meanwhile, back in the Hypnobri tomb, dissent among the tribe had reached its boiling point. Furious at Slithra's recent failures and inability to make the most of their newfound freedom, Scales had gathered enough secret followers throughout the Hypnobri ranks, and challenged his general to a duel in the Slither Pit. Win and Scales would take the title of general, gain a serpent tail to signify his rank, and lead the Hypnobri into their glorious future. Lose, and he would not only ever be able to challenge Lithra's rule again, but he and his followers would be banished from the tribe. And so, in an epic gladiatorial match, Scales and Slithra faced off, leadership of the Hypnobri tribe hanging in the balance. While Lloyd watched on, nervous that his general would be defeated, he managed to steal a map to the Serpentine tombs that had been sealed away with the Hypnobri, gaining it as collateral just in case his champion lost the fight. And as the duel raged on, Scales managed to incapacitate his opponent in a surprise attack, and just like that, Scales was crowned leader of the Hypnobri, ending the reign of Slithra. Back at the ruins of the monastery, the remaining ninja quickly grew regretful of the loss of Zane, missing his unique quirks, his cooking, and his strange charm. Scavenging amongst the rocks for food, the ninja had reached their lowest point when, in the skies above, the ice dragon hurtled down from the clouds. Zane returning to tell his team that he had left not because he was angry, but because he wanted to immediately find them a new home following the destruction of the monastery, and after circling the sea of sand in his dragon, he had accomplished his task. Leading them to a desolate sandy wasteland, Zane revealed what he had found, the near-intact remains of the Destiny's Bounty. 
In ancient times, in the prologue of the story, this vessel had been commanded by the terror of the endless sea, Captain Soto and his ragtag gang of pirates, who after defeating and trapping rival Jin pirate Captain Nauticon, had become obsessed with finding the Overlord's Dark Island, sending the bounty crashing upon the shore of Ninjago and ending his life. In the decades that followed, the seas had receded, giving way to a barren expanse of sand, and the old Destiny's bounty had come to rest in the desert, battered by the elements. And so, overjoyed at their new home, the ninja rushed to the bounty, apologizing to their friend Zane, who hung back and talked with Sensei Wu about the possibility that he was the green ninja, to which Wu replied that the future was uncertain, but Zane had a very promising journey ahead. And as the ninja laughed and celebrated in their new home, Lloyd was cast out of the Hypnobri tribe, no longer in control of the serpents. Encountering the bounty from afar, Lloyd sulked as he watched the ninja party and laugh together, yearning the companionship the team shared. And as he left the desert, he headed to the closest serpentine tomb on his map, graveyard resting place of the Fangpire tribe, whose venomous bite could turn anyone or anything into a serpentine hybrid. Making his way to an eerie graveyard shrouded in mist, Lloyd managed to unlock the mechanism for the Fangpire tube, and found himself confronted by Fangtum, two-headed general of the fearsome Fangpire. Agreeing to go along with the boys' demands out of amusement, and seeking to learn more about how the realm of Ninjago had changed in their absence, Fangtum led his tribe out from their tomb, seeking scrap metal and machines of war they could convert to their side. Back at the remains of the bounty, the ninja were tasked to clean and wash the inside of their new home, restoring the once molded and rotten wreckage of the bounty into a sparkling new vessel. In a blaze of elemental energy, the ninja washed over the wreckage, Jay using his nunchucks of lightning to power an array of tracking and flight computers installed into the bridge of the bounty, and Kai and Zane combining their powers to create a cleansing mist. As they toiled day and night, a pile of discarded junk and trash outside the vessel began to grow, and Jay's adoptive parents, Ed and Edna, decided to pay the gang a visit and meet their son's new friends. Embarrassed of the fact that he grew up in a junkyard, Jay was insolent and rude to his parents, quickly sending them away from the bounty to the surprise of his friends. Taken aback by Jay's behavior, the rest of the ninja spent the next few days convincing Jay to apologize to his parents and finally visit them at the junkyard, which he promised to eventually do. But Jay's window of time was closing fast, for Lloyd and the Fangpire had made their way to Ed and Edna's junkyard, which was the perfect place for the Redskin Serpents to convert vehicles and armor into living weapons, all controlled by the Fangpire Serpents. Ambushing the couple in the dead of night, the Fangpire struck swiftly and silently, converting motorcycles, helicopters, wrecking balls, and even a statue Ed was building of Jay into weapons of destruction. As Ed and Edna attempted to flee, they were bit by the Fangpire, and the transformation into Serpentine began to take root. During this time, unaware that his parents were in grave danger, Jay continued to work on the bounty, integrating servers and technology into the very belly of the machine. As he worked, Wu informed the ninja that their dragons were reaching a time of metamorphosis, where they had to return to the spirit coves and the realm of Oni and Dragon to undergo a transformative process that would mean the ninja had no longer any form of transportation. And so, as the dragons left and the ninja said goodbye to their steeds, Jay was convinced the bounty needed an upgrade to transport the team, installing jet engines to the sides and back of the ship to replace the need for these dragons. And finally, once most of the work had been completed, Jay agreed to go visit his parents at their junkyard and apologize for his behavior, only to find it completely overrun by the deadly serpents, now wielding fearsome vehicles and holding Ed and Edna hostage. The only antidote to their transformation into Serpentine was found in the staff of the Fangpire General, which was kept safe and close with Fangtum himself. And so, the ninja leapt into action, waging a battle against the newly created living vehicles, cornered by the fearsome Serpentine Wrecking Ball. As Jay led the charge to defend his home, he managed to commandeer the massive weapon of destruction, steering it towards his own statue, which had been converted by the snakes. But as the serpents took to the skies in their Fangpire helicopters, the ninja were left stranded on the ground, and Ed and Edna's condition was worsening. It was in that moment that Wu pulled the ninja close, explaining that now was the time to unlock the potential of their golden weapons of creation. When his father forged the four weapons, he imbued in them the ability to generate elemental vehicles from thin air, drawing from the raw elements themselves. 
And so, each ninja focused in on their weapons, resonating with the blades as they performed a series of intricate moves to unlock their powers. In a storm of lightning, wind, and energy, Jay summoned his lightning jet from the nunchucks of lightning. Leaping in a fiery dance with the Sword of Fire, Kai summoned the mighty Blade Cycle. Sending his shurikens of ice hurtling through the air, Zane brought forth the agile Ice Glider. And in a cataclysm of rock and earth rising from the ground, Cole used his Scythe of Quakes to summon his Tread Assault Craft. With four new vehicles created by the weapons, the ninja wasted no time to pursue the Fangpire, Jay remaining focused on his connection to lightning as he soared through the air, catching up with the Fangpire Copter and seizing the General Staff mid-flight. As the other ninja raced to meet him on the ground, Jay lost his focus, and in an instant, the jet vanished in a poof of smoke. But his objective had been completed, and now in his possession was a method to cure his parents. But the Fangpire would not stop until they reclaimed their staff, and in an instant, it was a race for the team to get back to the bounty, get it afloat, and use the anti-venom to cure Ed and Edna. Pursued by the now massive Fangpire army, Jay struggled to activate the bounty's flight mode. Until Ed lended a hand, the two engineers working harder than they had ever worked before to prep the massive pirate vessel for flight. And, at the push of a button, sails unfurled, jet engines extended, and massive aerodynamic spikes pivoted upwards, and the Destiny's bounty soared through the air for its first flight. Now safe from the Serpentine, the ninja used the anti-venom to cure Ed and Edna, Jay embracing his adoptive parents and apologizing for all their trials over the past day. In the commotion, the snake staff was dropped and returned to the Fangpire, but it was no longer needed as the ninja had cured Jay's parents and claimed their first victory over the Serpentine. Chapter 3, Pythor's Gambit Zane awoke with a start. Eerily, the rooms on the bounty were empty, and all he could see was his falcon circling outside the window. Roaming out onto the deck of the deserted vessel, Zane was unable to find his comrades as their ship soared through murky clouds and mist. But then, Zane felt a cold, a shadow lurking behind him. Lord Garmadon returned from his exile. Preparing to do battle, Zane was about to stand against the King of Shadows by himself, when out of nowhere, in a flash of light, the Green Ninja materialized on the scene. Battling Garmadon in a fury of punches and kicks, the legendary hero performed Spinjitsu, summoning a dazzling emerald tornado of energy, while a stunned Garmadon could only watch. In an epic duel, the Green Ninja used the nunchucks of lightning and the strength of Earth to blast Garmadon off the bounty, sending the Dark Lord to his seeming doom. But when Zane turned, this ninja had fire in his hands and the falcon on his shoulder, eyes ablaze with light. As more and more copies of the falcon began to surround this mysterious stranger, Zane cried out, demanding he reveal himself, just as he awoke in reality on the bounty and realized it was all a dream. Sharing this revelation with the rest of the ninja, the four heroes were distracted by what it meant, and which of them was meant to be the green ninja, for the hero in Zane's dream wielded aspects of all four of their personalities and elements. Frustrated that his pupils were not taking training seriously, Wu demanded that they give him the answer to one of the most important questions of all. What is the best way to defeat your enemy? Meanwhile, back in the frozen wastelands of Ninjago, Lloyd rode alongside a new Fangpire army towards the icy crypt of the Hypnobri, seeking to gain revenge. Fangtum, who shared no love for the former Hypnobri ruler Slithra, agreed to march on the hypnotic snakes in a bid for power, seeking to rule not only the Fangpire, but the Hypnobri as well. But as the two armies of snakes met on the battlefield, Fangtum was surprised to find the general in charge was not Slithra, but his old friend Scales, who had recently taken control of the Hypnobri. As the two leaders agreed to stop the conflict before it could begin, they began scheming as to what to do with Lloyd, eventually deciding to turn the young menace into a serpentine with the bite of a fangpire. Fleeing from the menacing snakes, Lloyd was catapulted away from the two armies, mapped to the serpentine tombs still in hand. Making his way to the Sea of Sand in the Desert of Doom, Lloyd was now frustrated at his failure to command either Serpentine tribe, but now doubly determined to gain his revenge. Legends told of the powerful Anachondri, who turned the tide of the Serpentine Wars and were commanded by the fearsome General Arturus. 
strongest and most powerful of all the serpents, these anachondri had the ability to turn invisible, making them perfect for stealth incursions. Known to not play well with others and their ambition to control all other serpentine tribes, these anachondri would be the perfect tribe to free next. And as Lloyd approached the isolated spire tomb in the middle of the desert, he was excited for what he would find. But as the young Lloyd opened the gate to the tomb, he was surprised to find nothing but bones. As he entered the dreary tomb of the anachondri, there were no signs of life whatsoever. Someone or something had killed all of the anachondri off long ago. But as he turned his back to the tomb, a sinister shape materialized from thin air. Pythor, last surviving member of the anachondri tribe. Introducing himself to the frightened Lloyd as Pythor P. Chumsworth, the purple-scaled serpent explained that somehow all his fellow tribe members died off, conveniently omitting the fact that it was Pythor himself who killed the rest of his tribe and cannibalized them in a desperate bid for survival and food. Pretending to befriend the young child to get close to him and take the map to the other tribes, Pythor bided his time, humoring the child and terrorizing the people of Jamonikai village as the duo stole candy, broke every rule in sight, and bonded over the course of a day. By nightfall, Lloyd was comfortable with Pythor and truly believed they were friends, and Pythor plotted to use this complacency to his advantage. As Lloyd explained how he was kicked out of Darkly's boarding school for a lack of ambition, Pythor proposed the duo attack the school at first light, taking revenge on the institution for kicking out Lloyd. And so, Darkly's soon found itself under siege by Pythor and Lloyd, who had hoped to use the attack as an excuse to draw out the ninja and take down some of the greatest heroes in Ninjago. Keeping watch atop the tower, Pythor and Lloyd scanned the surface below as the ninja geared up at the bounty, activating the powerful flight capabilities of the pirate craft to blast off from the ocean and soar to the school. As the heroes flew downwards on the bounty's anchor, wrecking much of the academy in the process, each ninja battled their way upwards, tangling with Pythor, and quickly realizing that he was a formidable foe, much more powerful than any other serpentine they encountered. As they made their way to the top of the structure, Lloyd could do nothing but scream for Pythor's help as the heroes arrived on the scene. But in that instant, Pythor double-crossed Lloyd, stealing the map of the tombs for himself and leaving Lloyd to face the consequences as he vanished into thin air. And soon enough, Lloyd found himself captured by the ninja and his uncle Wu and was brought aboard the bounty. It was then that Wu did something truly unexpected. Tucking the young Lloyd in for bed and reading him a bedtime story about never trusting a snake, the child was finally at home and at peace because of Wu, much to the ninja's dismay that he would not be punished for his actions. Taking his pupils aside, Wu explained the answer to his question posed days ago. The best way to defeat your enemy is to turn them into your friend. And with Lloyd no longer a threat to the ninja, but Pythor still at large, the Destiny's bounty sailed off into the sunset. As the ninja continued to train on the bounty and hunt down Pythor, they slowly grew accustomed to living with Lloyd Garmadon, who began to aid Sensei Wu in their training. As part of a lesson about the destructive power of rumors, Wu tasked Lloyd to sow conflict amongst the ninja, framing Cole for erasing Kai's video game scores, Jay for messing up Cole's soup recipe, Zane for making the robotic training dummy too hard for Jay, and Kai for washing his red gi with Zane's white, dyeing it pink. As the ninja argued and fought amongst themselves, Wu revealed that the incidents were all done by Lloyd, who would use his mischievous nature to his advantage in teaching the ninja a lesson. But on the bridge, Nia was hard at work studying the locations of the three known tombs when she discovered a pattern. Beaming a serpentine symbol on the map of Ninjago, she realized that the final two tombs had to be located in specific areas of the realm. And so, the ninja split up and sped to the long-lost location of the tombs. Cole and Zane made their way to the isolated Constricti tomb deep within the confines of a hollowed-out mountain, only to find the hatch had already been opened, and the tunneling Constricti tribe had been unleashed on Ninjago. After a brief tussle with General Scalador, leader of the Constricti, Zane and Cole only managed to free themselves with the Sacred Flute and rushed to the toxic bogs to warn Kai and Jay, who were walking straight into a trap. And sure enough, at the toxic bogs, the ninja were ambushed by the deadly Venomari, infecting Kai with their hallucinogenic venom and causing the ninja of fire to lash out in fear, paralyzed by illusions. As Zane and Cole tried to use the sacred flute, Pythor arrived on the scene, snatching the ancient artifact from the ninja and sending the Constricti and Venomari, led by Serpentine historian General Asidicus, to surround the heroes. 
but just when all seemed lost, a massive mechanical samurai arrived on the scene. Wielding an array of high-tech gadgets and weaponry, this Samurai X battled both Venomari and Constricti forces at once, managing to hit Pythor with a tracking dart as the villains fled. As the mechanism inside this mysterious samurai opened and its masked pilot stepped into the light, the ninja attempted to converse with the stranger, who instead sprayed the group with sleeping gas, knocking them out as the samurai made their escape. As the bounty swooped in to pick them up and the four ninja came to, they began to discuss who this mysterious Samurai X was and why they were hiding their identity. But there was little time to discuss, for they were hot on Pythor's trail, tracking the Anachondri foe to the center of Ninjago City, where he had summoned all freed Serpentine from across the land into a meeting of the five tribes for the first time in centuries. Gathering in the abandoned subway systems below the city, Hypnobri, Venomari, Constricti, and Fangpire alike all listened to Pythor, who had struck a deal with Hypnobri leader Scales to unite their forces. But this time, the ninja were prepared, and sneaking amongst the crowd, they used the power of rumors to spread lies and conflict among the assembled tribes, causing the snakes to turn on each other and ignore Pythor's rallying calls, for now. Skirmishing with the serpents as they made their escape, the ninja returned to the bounty victorious over Pythor, having thwarted his attempt to unite the five tribes to accomplish his dark plans. But the cunning Anachondri would not give up so easily, and as the days passed, Pythor explained his master plan to Scales, to awaken the fearsome Great Devourer, legendary serpent that was destined to one day consume the entire realm of Ninjago, and the very same serpent who was responsible for infecting the blood of Lord Garmadon, unlocking his Oni side years ago. While the Great Devourer had not been seen since then, rumors spoke of four silver fang blades, nearly indestructible teeth of the Great Devourer, that when assembled in the ancient serpentine capital of Ouroboros, would hold the power to awaken the Great Devourer from its slumber. And so, Scales and Pythor ventured to the Sea of Sand to unearth the long-buried city of Ouroboros, uncovered an ancient mechanism to unveil the forgotten City of Snakes, rising from the ground itself in a whirlwind of sand. And in an instant, the ruins of the lost city of Ouroboros rose again, and Pythor now had a city to operate from. Over these weeks, the ninja had their hands full with serpentine strikes from all across the realm. Equipping new armor to protect themselves from fangpire bites, the four heroes were now more well-equipped than ever to deal with the rising threat. From incursions into Mega Monster Amusement Park to attacks on Birchwood Forest Villagers, the four freed Serpentine Tribes, now free and unleashed without a leader, terrorized the land like the days of old. But each time, the ninja arrived on the scene too late, for the mysterious Samurai X had already battled back the Serpents, overwhelming the scattered Serpentine forces with technological force and might. As the ninja grew more and more frustrated with the samurai, they began to make overt plays to defeat this mysterious vigilante and unmask them once and for all. But each time, the ninja were overwhelmed, and as they grew more and more desperate to know their opponent, Jay even attempted to masquerade as a damsel in distress on the railway tracks, only for the samurai to see right through the ruse and depart immediately after rescuing him. At the same time, the ninja took turns watching Lloyd, who was growing more restless without a true place on the team. Without the skills of a ninja or the technological knowledge of Nia, Lloyd felt guilty for his role in freeing the Serpentine, and one day snuck off to follow the Serpents themselves. Purchasing a Serpent outfit and sneaking aboard a Serpentine bus to Ouroboros, Lloyd discovered the location of the now fully populated Snake City in the desert, and witnessed Pythor rally the four other tribes once again in a bid to become King of the Serpents. In a slither pit duel, Pythor challenged Scales, Fangtim, Asidicus, and Scalador to a battle for command of all their tribes. But he and Scales had a trick up their sleeves, and secretly plugging their own ears, Pythor used the sacred flute he had stolen from the ninja to force the other generals to submit to him. And each serpentine tribe leader threw down their staff and crowned Pythor as king of all five tribes. Forcing all the Serpentine to bow to their new master, Pythor had achieved his first goal of uniting the tribes, and in the process, they discovered the young Lloyd in their midst, capturing the boy to use him as leverage against the ninja. Quickly realizing Lloyd had gone missing, the ninja followed the tracks of the Serpentine bus to the Lost Snake City, where they were swiftly captured and thrown into the arena, and forced to do battle with Samurai X, who had somehow also been captured days ago. 
With their golden weapons taken and only their wits and their fists, Ninja prepared to do battle with Samurai, for only the victor would be allowed to leave the city. In a quick skirmish, the ninja were swiftly overwhelmed until they unleashed their ultimate weapon, the Tornado of Creation, summoning bits of rubble and rock into a massive slingshot which they used against the robotic mech. But as the ground began to shake and Pythor activated a sliding mechanism, Samurai X revealed they had a plan. And leaping forth from the mech, the Samurai activated its rocket boosters, flying the ninja to safety while staying behind to contend with the snakes. Regaining the golden weapons but failing to free Lloyd, Samurai X jetted off, only to run out of fuel and plummet into the desert, crash landing near Kai. And in that moment, the Samurai removed its helmet, revealing that it was Nia, Kai's sister, the entire time. Since she was uninterested in being a ninja, she had used the past months to hone her own unique fighting style, combining technology with martial arts to create the persona of Samurai X, Hero of the Realm. Making Kaida promise to keep her secret, Nia blasted back off onto the bounty, only to be greeted by Sensei Wu, who revealed that he knew it was her the entire time, and had used her rivalry with the ninja to encourage both sides to sharpen each other's skills. And as the days grew on, each ninja trained harder and harder, desperately trying to locate the Serpentine who had fled from the city and free Lloyd, who was still captured by Pythor and his goons. Zane spent more and more time underwater, practicing his mindfulness and holding his breath. Kai sprinted across hot coals with ease. Jay balanced atop the tallest building in Ninjago amidst a lightning storm. And Cole lifted inhuman weights with his enhanced strength. The four ninja had reached peak physical condition. But there were still many challenges to overcome. And while they may have reached their physical peak, the greatest challenge of unlocking their dormant elemental abilities and finally finding their true potential was yet to come. Chapter 4 True Potential The time had come for the ninja to learn the full truth. Sensei Wu gathered his pupils, who had now reached peak fighting condition, and told them the tale of young Garmadon, revealing that he blamed himself for making his brother retrieve the weapon, and kicking off a series of events that would lead to the coming of the Dark Lord and the Bite of the Devourer. Consumed with guilt over Garmadon and suspecting he knew where his brother fled to after the Underworld, Wu informed the ninja that they no longer needed him, and left the bounty, tasking them with rescuing Lloyd and unlocking their true elemental potential as first priority. Traveling to an obscure tea shop, Wu reconvened with his father's old ally Mistake, Oni defector in disguise who once helped Wu's father defeat the darkness of the three Oni warlords after falling in love with the beauty of the realm of Ninjago. As the Rolled Master caught up with the ancient Oni, the rest of the ninja were left to seek out the Fang Blades themselves and prevent the Great Devourer from being unleashed. For collecting the Fang Blades first meant the ninja could destroy the blades at their source, Torchfire Mountain, the volcano with the power to destroy the Fang Blades themselves. Having deciphered the legend of the ancient Fang Blades in the now abandoned Constricti Tomb, the ninja were searching for the legendary artifacts when Zane was distracted by the reappearance of his mysterious falcon companion, who had brought them great fortune in the past. Following the bird through the realm and scaling cliffs, mountains, and vast passageways, the ninja rushed to follow the falcon on a great quest, each one slowly tiring out and falling back while Zane's endurance held strong, eventually reaching the snowy birchwood forest in the mountains. Alone and isolated from the rest of his team, all Zane could see were endless columns of birch trees rising into the sky. And to his dismay, the falcon began to twitch and plummet, dropping like a stone. All around him, metal footsteps echoed, and the ninja of ice prepared for battle. Emerging from the trees, a robotic sentry launched into battle, blasting beams of energy at Zane as he dodged and rushed to bring the falcon to safety. As the Copper Garden continued to warn of an intruder, Zane was pushed back, leaping onto its back and ripping out chunks of wire and metal, shutting down this mysterious sentry. As the robot collapsed, Zane observed a mysterious symbol engraved on its back, and noted the same symbol on a nearby tree. Uncovering a secret laboratory built into the tree itself, Zane descended the narrow steps to a secret laboratory, filled with ancient blueprints of designs long forgotten and to his surprise, he found a set of blueprints to the falcon itself, revealing its robotic nature, and directly beneath that, blueprints for none other than his own Nindroid body. 
As hours passed and Zane contemplated his nature as a ninjroid, the rest of the ninja finally caught up to him, taken aback by this shocking revelation. As Zane reactivated his memory switch and visions of his inventor and father, Dr. Julian came rushing back. He shared the tale of the Tinkerer with his friends, and how his father had seemingly passed away years ago. But what Zane did not know was that Dr. Julian had been kidnapped by Samakai and imprisoned mere moments after his memory was wiped, but this revelation would not be unveiled until months later. Asking his friends to give him some time to grapple with the discovery of his identity, Zane stayed behind as Kai, Jay, and Cole ventured back out to the Birchwood Forest, only to be ambushed by a roving herd of territorial treehorns, spider-like beasts who mimicked the birch trees themselves. As the three ninja were swiftly beaten by the overwhelming foe, Zane emerged from the lab, now more sure of himself than ever before. With the question of his past no longer holding him back, Zane had embraced who he was, and leaping in a whirlwind of ice and snow, shurikens whirring and hovering in his hands, Zane unlocked his true potential, the element of ice now surging from his body. Blasting rays of pure winter at the Treehorn Queen, Zane battled back the encroaching monster single-handedly, demonstrating the pure power of ice and snow. In awe of their friend's true potential, the rest of the ninja could only watch as the ninjroid of ice levitated in midair, blasting powerful elemental beams in every direction, and only stopping when the threat was over. During all this, Pythor was rallying his serpentine legions to uncover the location of the four silver fangblades, and with the combination of the anti-venom present in each tribe leader staff, the long-forgotten map to the hiding places of the four blades was revealed, and Pythor was closer than ever to achieving his dark desires. At the same time, Wu had left Mistake's tea shop, venturing to the peak of an isolated mountain and using Mistake's special Oni blend of Traveler's Tea to open a portal through the ethereal divide itself, teleporting in a flash to the realm of madness. This primordial world of darkness had been marked by an imbalance of light and darkness, and soon enough, Wu was confronted by the man he was seeking, his brother, Lord Garmadon. Now sporting four arms and wielding untold power, Garmadon charged at his brother as the two engaged in a deadly duel, Wu begging him to stop and hear him out, and Garmadon refusing to heed his brother's words. Pushed back to a murky swamp, the old sensei found himself surrounded by mud monsters, the light of his benjutsu unable to battle back the overwhelming darkness. Just as Wu was about to be suffocated by the creatures, he revealed the reason why he had came. Garmadon's son Lloyd was in grave danger, kidnapped by the Serpentine, and even the evil of Garmadon's Oni blood was not enough to overcome how much he cared for his son, and in a moment of clarity, Garmadon pulled his brother Wu from the grip of the monsters. As both brothers stood together as equals, Garmadon agreed to set his dark plans aside until his son was safe, and so an uneasy alliance was formed. Back on the bounty, Nia was prepping the team about the potential cure to Fangpire Bites, drastically increased heart rate. Showcasing an ancient Fangpire skeleton specimen, Nia was explaining to the gang how she had researched this artifact, when she was forced to stop, for she was having an allergic reaction to perfume in the room. Realizing Kai had given him women's perfume as a prank, Jay was embarrassed, admitting he had worn it to impress Nia, and finally asking her out on a proper date, to which she quickly accepted. Planning to enjoy a night out at a fancy restaurant, Jay and Nia went their separate ways, but not before Jay inadvertently pricked his hand on the Fangpire skeleton, whose venom was still as fresh as the day the specimen died, starting Jay's slow transformation into a serpentine. As the ninja continued to scour the lands for the serpents, Pythor wasted no time in rushing to the location of the first and closest Fangblade, Mega Monster Amusement Park. Blending in with the costume performers, the Serpentine slithered in, but not before being forced to take photos with the guests, alerting the ninja to their presence and forcing the heroes to redirect the bounty to the amusement park. With Nia's Samurai X tracker notifying her of the Serpentine presence and Jay being forced to go to the park with the rest of the ninja, they both decided to move the date location to the theme park itself, Jay still unaware of Nia's secret identity. But as the Ninja of Lightning got ready and the night was soon at hand, he quickly realized that he had been infected by Fangpire Venom, but refused to let that jeopardize his date, instead bundling up in gloves and a scarf to mask his transformation. 
As the pair arrived in the restaurant, Jay spent the entire day talking about his exaggerated accomplishments, his insecurities taking control as he overcompensated for his own skills, and Nia quickly picking up on this false bravado. But as the transformation got worse and Jay felt a serpentine tail begin to sprout, he rushed to the bathroom, just as Nia's bracelet serpentine tracker alerted her to Pythor's presence, and she quickly ran out to confront the snakes. As the rest of the ninja tried and failed to stop Pythor from seizing the Fangblade, Zane still unable to control the full might of his true potential, Nia as Samurai X leapt onto the scene, snatching the Fangblade and fleeing from the snakes, despite her rocket boosters failing. Fighting back waves of tunneling constricti and attacking Fangpire, Samurai X was eventually overcome by the serpents, her identity forcefully revealed as Nia to the world. Strapping her to a roller coaster hooked up to a fiery ring and broken tracks, Pythor cackled as he regained the Fangblade and slithered off, leaving the ninja to contend with this dastardly trap. While Kai, Zane, and Cole were too late to arrive on the scene, flash frozen by Zane's true potential by accident, Jay rushed out of the restaurant and left to save Nia, fighting desperately to free her from the restraints. As the coaster rattled onwards and the pair grew more resigned to their fate, Nia made sure to tell Jay that he didn't need to pretend to be someone else. Who he was was good enough, and the best version of himself was someone who didn't have to pretend that he was someone else. Giving Jay a kiss as the roller coaster reached its breaking point, Nia watched as Jay's skin began to glow, his heartbeat increasing as he fought off the serpentine venom. Now cured of the bite and secured himself, Jay's eyes began to crackle with pure lightning as he hovered into the air, generating a storm of electricity and energy around him. And in a flash of brilliant white light, Jay discovered his true potential. Teleporting to the front of the coaster, Jay stopped the machine in the nick of time, saving Nia and himself, his body crackling with pure electricity. And with that, two of the team had unlocked the potential of the elements within them. Yet Pythor was now one step closer to freeing the Devourer, first Fangblade in hand. Immediately departing for the location of the next Fangblade, Pythor, Scales, and the Serpentine made their way to the Desert of Doom, reaching one of the ancient Serpentine Pyramids of old, from the time of King Mambo V and the Serpentine of the Valley. Realizing the pyramid was laden with deadly traps and pitfalls, Pythor called for Lloyd to be sent in, promising the boy to set him free should he retrieve the next blade. And so, darting between falling rocks, arrows, and sinking ground, Lloyd sprinted to the location of the blade, only to find it was long since taken from the temple. Because years ago, legendary explorer Clutch Powers, on a mission for his famed Explorers Club, had ventured into the very same pyramid to claim the Fang Blade later deciding to transform the relic into a prize for a singing and dance competition, the Blade Cup. And back on the bounty, Cole had come to this exact revelation, for his father Lau had won the Blade Cup several years ago in a row with his band, the Royal Blacksmiths. The only problem was that Cole had been living a lie for the past few years. Following the death of his mother Lily, Cole had left his home under the ruse that he was going off to study at the Marty Oppenheimer School of Performing Arts, when he instead had been aimlessly climbing mountains and testing the limits of his body when Wu had found him. Refusing to let Cole's estrangement from his father stop them, the four ninjas suited up and posed as fellow dance students, seeking training from Lao for the big competition. Heading to Cole's hometown village and meeting his father, the group kept up the ruse and helped Cole keep his secret, only making the ninja of Earth more and more guilty. But the ninja had no time to waste, for the Serpentine had also learned of the existence of the Blade Cup, and in a scheme only Pythor could cook up, the Serpentine entered their own team into the competition, Pythor eating one of the judges whole to pose as a talent show grader and help his team cheat their way into victory. But so, training under Lau, the ninja were ill-equipped to enter a dancing competition, to say the least. Cole particularly resentful that his father repeatedly tried to force him to execute the Triple Tiger Sashay, one of the hardest dancing moves in existence. And as the date of the competition grew nearer, the ninja slowly but surely learned their moves and got into dancing shape, all while Pythor worked behind the scenes to sabotage the results and present his own team of Serpentine in disguise. Meanwhile, in the Realm of Madness, Wu and Garmadon were forced to work as a unit once again after so many years apart, battling as brothers as they fought their way through waves of foul creatures of mud and stone, fighting to reach the peak of the Mountain of Madness, which contained a portal back to the Realm of Ninjago. 
hours turned to days, and there seemed no end in sight, for the road was long and their battle hard. But in the struggle, Wu and Garmadon managed to reconnect, strengthening their bond and talking about Lloyd's exploits and adventures. Finally making their way to the peak, the pair hurtled through space and time, tearing a rift open to the world of Ninjago. And the Dark Lord had finally returned to his original realm, overwhelmed with glee. Back in Ninjago City, it was the night of the great talent show, but the ninja were still unprepared to win. Finally reaching his breaking point, Cole proposed that they steal the Blade Cup and be done with it, never intending to interact with his father or his dancing troupe again, only for Lao to overhear, aghast at his son's proposition. While Cole tried to salvage the situation and explain to Lao that he was a ninja and was striving his own path, Lao doubled down that anyone who was willing to cheat and take the easy route to win was no son of his, refusing to watch the show. But Cole and his team had little time to make amends, for before they knew it, they were thrust on stage. Deciding to instead showcase their combat prowess as ninja instead of performing the traditional dance routine, the four heroes battled Serpentine on stage, all sent by Pythor to foil their chances of seizing the Blade Cup. And Cole, mixing ninja skills and what his father had taught him, performed the famous Triple Tiger Sachet for the first time, wowing the crowd and enlisting high scores from all the judges, even the one Pythor had swallowed whole, reaching out of the Serpentine's mouth to applaud the ninja. Not even Pythor's manipulation and threats could overcome this success, and while the Serpentine team nearly won due to Pythor's threats, they were overthrown by the ninja who seized the Blade Cup and were finally in possession of this sacred artifact. Proud of his team, but still in conflict over how he parted with his father, Cole hung back, only to be greeted by Lao, who made amends with his son, proclaiming his pride when seeing him and his team win the Blade Cup fairly, and in their own way. But as the pair reconciled and turned their back to the treacherous Serpentine, Pythor rigged a massive crate to fall on Lao, only for Cole to unlock his true potential in that very moment, summoning a mighty sandstorm of rocks and earth while blasting away the rubble with superhuman strength, saving his father as his body glowed a pure orange and white. But in the commotion, Pythor seized the Blade Cup, and now only needed two more Fang Blades to fulfill his dreams. And as the ninja returned to the bounty, they needed to train harder than ever to stop their foe and save Lloyd. Beating back waves of dummies in the middle of the night, Cole, Zane, and Jay used the might of their true potential to obliterate the training foes, slowly but surely gaining control over their volatile elements. But Kai hung back, the last of the group to unlock his potential. Stealing the green ninja outfit from Wu's partners, Kai donned the legendary robe of the green savior, leaping around the bounty in a flurry of moves, much to the amusement of his team. But alas, things did not change, and to the disappointment of the fire ninja, donning the suit of the green ninja would not change his current state. But little did the ninja know that the time of legends was at hand and they were moments away from the revelation of the Green Ninja's identity, which would forever change the course of Ninjago's history. Chapter 5 The Green Ninja Making their way back to the bounty, Wu and Garmadon arrived at the home of the ninja, who were shocked to see their greatest foe yet working together with their old master. Despite Garmadon explaining that he had set aside his plans for conquest to rescue his son as top priority, Kai refused to trust the Dark Lord, who began to live with them over the coming weeks. While the rest of the ninja began to grow slowly accustomed to Garmadon's presence on the bounty, Nia even remarking that she felt sorry for the Dark Lord's inability to connect with others, Kai remained ever vigilant, paranoid that Garmadon had ulterior motives for being there to steal the golden weapons. As the ninja continued to train, Wu called Nia into a secret chamber in the bounty. Placing the golden weapons and green ninja outfit before her, Wu asked her to step forwards, suspecting that she was the legendary green ninja. But before they got a chance to try, Nia refused, after seeing how obsessed Kai and the others had become with the title and satisfied with her current role as Samurai X. But noticing Wu and Nia had been discussing the Green Ninja, Kai began to eavesdrop outside when he was confronted by Garmadon, and the two began to threaten each other right before Wu and Nia rushed outside and broke up the fight. Back on the bridge, Kai realized their golden weapons were gone, and acting impulsively, he rushed down to the inner rooms, finding Garmadon in control of all four weapons. 
Acting rashly before Garbodon could explain himself, Kai leapt into battle, believing that if he defeated Garbodon, his true potential would unlock and he would become the Green Ninja. Locking the door and engaging in a duel with the Dark Lord, Kai managed to knock Garmin onto the ground just as Cole and the others burst in, stopping Kai, who was stunned to see that his true potential did not unlock. But then, Wu explained that he had asked Garmin to retrieve their weapons, and the Dark Lord had allowed himself to be defeated. And Kai realized that Garmin was indeed innocent, and all he had done was make a fool of himself. But there was little time to discuss, for Zane's falcon spotted a convoy of Serpentine headed through the Forest of Tranquility to the Fire Temple, a caged Lloyd in tow. Quickly jetting off to the temple, the ninja Garmanon and Wu arrived on the scene, ready to confront the serpents and rescue Lloyd once and for all. As they entered the temple, they found the volcano nearing eruption, with lava and rubble falling down all around them. As they entered the inner chamber inside the mountain, the ninja came face to face with Pythor and the rest of his serpentine, who had claimed the third fang blade. Engaging in an epic showdown, the heroes bravely beat back the assembled serpentine, with Kai being forced to sheath the sword of fire due to its presence accelerating the volcanic eruption. But as Constricti tunneled through the mountain, causing spurts of lava to rush upwards, the ninja soon realized that they had to flee before the eruption consumed them all. Refusing to accept defeat, Kai rushed at the Serpentine, pinning the Fang Blade to the wall as Pythor and Scales were forced to leave. At the same time, Garmanon fought desperately to save his son, blasting through waves of Serpentine in epic clashes to rescue Lloyd and refusing to stop until his son was safe. But as Kai was about to claim the Fang Blade, the rock underneath Lloyd crumbled, sending the boy careening into the lava. And as Wu and the ninja dragged Garmanon out of the temple to save him, Kai was left with a crucial choice. Claim the Fang Blade, stop Pythor from releasing the Devourer, and become the greatest hero in the realm. Or save Lloyd, a seemingly insignificant child. Over the past few months, Kai had been laser focused on being the greatest hero, becoming the Green Ninja, stopping Pythor. But in that moment, Kai understood what it truly meant to be a hero. And leaving the Fang Blade behind, he leapt from rock to rock in a whirlwind of fiery spinjitsu, sweeping Lloyd into his grasp, and finally unlocking the awesome power of his true potential. Glowing a fiery orange, Kai blasted off from the mountain, Lloyd in tow, rescuing the young boy and fulfilling his destiny. And while Pythor was now able to reclaim the Fang Blade, claiming three of the four items he needed to release the Devourer, Kai was satisfied that he had made the right choice that would not fill him with regret, and learn to be selfless. It was then that Kai made a stunning revelation. All of his training to become the greatest ninja was not to be the Green Ninja, it was to protect him. And so, to Garmanon's dismay, the ninja placed the golden weapons before Lloyd as they instantly began to glow a brilliant emerald, hovering around him with undeniable proof that Lloyd was the Green Ninja. And as for Garmanon, he was now more conflicted than ever, realizing that the battle lines had been drawn, brother versus brother, and now father versus son. The evil Oni side of his blood was far too strong to turn back now, and Garmanon knew that in time, it would fully overtake his reasoning, and he may be forced to one day battle Lloyd until one of them was ultimately defeated. Stunned by this revelation, Garmanon retreated to his quarters to think about his next moves, and the rest of the ninja wasted no time in hunting down the Serpentine. Days later and still no sign of Pythor or the Serpents, the ninja managed to track down one Venomari, Spina, in Ninjago City, who after being cornered, admitted that Pythor was insane, and releasing the Devourer would mean that all of Ninjago, including the Serpentine themselves, would be consumed. And as the ninja discovered a secret underground lair connecting all five Serpentine tombs, it was soon clear that their final battle with the Serpentine was approaching, and if they didn't stop Pythor then, it would be far too late. And so, Ninja, Samurai X, and Wu geared up to descend into the tunnels and confront the Serpentine in their main base, while Garmanon stayed back to protect Lloyd. Rushing into the tunnels, the six heroes bravely fought their way through waves of Serpentine, only to be trapped in a massive cage, Pythor revealing himself as having claimed the final Fang Blade, and with all four collected, he was now ready to fulfill his dastardly scheme. Realizing that the ninja had been captured, Garmanon rushed off for reinforcements, leaving Lloyd to assume his father had abandoned them. 
Donning the legendary outfit of the Green Ninja and rushing into the caves to save his friends, Lloyd made a brave stand against the serpents, only for them to laugh and belittle him. For without any training or skill, the young Lloyd still had a long journey ahead to becoming a ninja at all, much less the greatest in the realm. And just as all seemed lost, sounds of echoing footsteps filled the corridors as bones rattled and axes ringed in the dark. The Skulkin had returned. Led by Lord Garmadon, who had returned to the underworld to recruit his old army to fight the snakes, the Skulkin had been itching for a battle, and given the chance to take down the Serpentine, many of whom they had fought while still alive, the undead warriors leapt at the chance. Rushing into battle against the combined might of all the Serpentine tribes, the Skulkin provided enough time for the ninja to escape and join the fray, seizing the four fang blades from Pythor and gaining the upper hand. Realizing that he was outnumbered, Pythor quickly turned invisible, plotting his next move while allowing the heroes to think they had won. And so, the battle was seemingly over. In an emotional goodbye, Garmadon bid farewell to his son, stating that although they were now on opposite sides, he was still very proud of his son, and knew that one day, Lloyd would grow to become a great man. The ninja had claimed all four fang blades and prepared to rush off to the only place hot enough to melt them down, Torchfire Mountain. But little did they know that Pythor had snuck aboard, and this victory had left them with all of nothing. Chapter 6 Devastation of the Devourer The night after the battle, a furious storm raged in the clouds above Ninjago. As the Destiny's bounty hurtled at full speed to Torchfire Mountain, Sensei Wu meditated in his room, spirit smoke filling the air as flashes of the future began to overwhelm him. The ninja surrounded by Serpentine, Wu facing off against Pythor in the city of Ouroboros, and the Great Devourer itself rising from the ground. Deeply troubled by these visions, Wu rushed to ensure all was okay, and saw nothing out of the ordinary. But as the ninja and Nia dined in the meeting room and weathered out the storm, they failed to notice young Lloyd had vanished, for while practicing in the dojo room, Lloyd had been ambushed by the treacherous Pythor, who had snuck up on the green ninja while invisible and left him bound and gagged. Biding his time for the ninja to arrive at Torchfire Mountain, where he had arranged a serpentine ambush on the ground, Pythor slithered away, watching and waiting. The next morning, the bounty finally arrived directly above the mountain, Nia navigating the flying vessel in position while the four ninjas solemnly prepared to cast the fang blades into the fire and end the threat of Pythor and the Devourer for good. But before they had the chance, Pythor materialized on the scene, lashing out at Wu and forcing the ninja to save their old master, leaving the fang blades for Pythor to claim. And despite the best efforts of Lloyd, who had managed to free himself, and Nia as Samurai X, who did her best to corner the serpent, Pythor fled the bounty with the fang blades in hand, fleeing on his fangpire copter with scales. Seizing a Ninjago City tour bus and transforming it into a serpentine fortress, Pythor and his gang prepared to do battle with the ninja, all while speeding to the lost city of Ouroboros to awaken the Devourer. Guns sprouted from its sides while serpent motorbikes poured out of its walls, while the ninja, Wu, and Samurai X fought bravely to catch up with the train and reclaim the fang blades. But soon enough, it was too late, and despite all their efforts, Pythor managed to escape to the city alone, only Wu in tow to stop the villain by himself. Realizing it was his destiny to face Pythor without the ninja, and hoping to buy his team time to escape and prepare for the coming of the Devourer, Wu left behind the ninja and journeyed with Pythor to the city, where he watched as the maniacal serpent placed the four fang blades in unique grooves carved of solid stone. The very ground began to shake. Venom poured from the fangs of the stone serpent, eyes aglow with fury. Rivets and grooves oozed with noxious green fumes, forming intricate spirals and patterns in the rock and stone. As the mad serpentine Pythor cackled and proclaimed the resurrection of his god, Wu could only watch in horror as a deep growl emanated from deep in the core of the realm, rocks cascading down all around him. As the sky darkened and lightning crackled above, the surface of the earth heaved, ripping open as a gargantuan serpent rose from deep within the underground bowels. Now realizing the weight of what he had done, Pythor shrieked in fear, slithering away from the Devourer until he was caught and held by Wu, forcing him to witness what he had unleashed. 
and just as Kai, Jay, Zane, Cole, Nia, and Lloyd caught up to the dreadful scene, the Devourer bellowed a fearsome roar as it reawakened after years of slumber. And, in an instant, both Sensei Wu and Pythor were devoured by its gaping maw. Fearing their sensei was gone for good, the ninja had little time to process before the devourer turned its attention to them, growing exponentially in size for each object or being devoured. As they fled to the bounty and Nia fired up the engines, the devourer began its pursuit, burrowing through the ground as it lashed out in a flying boat, which was running on reserve fuel after the chase of the serpentine train. As Nia expertly navigated the vessel to Scatter Canyon, the ninja desperately threw every item they could offboard to lighten the vessel, coming to the sickening realization that the more the devourer consumed, the bigger it got. And just when they thought they had lost the serpent, the great devourer erupted from the ground, slashing the bounty with its spiked tail and forcing the ninja to abandon ship and say goodbye to their home. And in a single powerful bite, the Devourer splintered the bounty, splitting the famed vessel in two and destroying the home our team had grown to love. As the ninja regrouped and mourned the loss of Wu, the Serpentine fled to the Fangpire tomb, realizing Pythor was mad and the Devourer would consume everything, including all the Serpentine. Hiding underground as the Devourer rampaged towards Ninjago City, the Serpentine had much to ponder of their recent actions but the first question on their minds was who would lead them now. And as the Devourer continued its conquest, Kai had an idea. The sound of the sacred flute was incredibly harmful to Serpentine, so why not amplify Zane's recording of the sound to weaponize it against the Devourer? And so, the ninja sped to Ed and Edna's junkyard, using the Tornado of Creation to summon a mighty ultrasonic raider just in time for the Devourer to appear on the scene. With Ed and Edna gone to a rally in Ninjago City against the Serpentine hosted by Cole's father Lau and his royal blacksmiths, the ninja realized the stakes were higher than ever, with everyone and anything they cared about in the city itself, and they had to prevent the cursed beast from reaching the population center. And so, the ninja hopped in the raider and fired volleys of pure sonic waves at the Devourer, uncovering a weak spot in the center of its head. As the Devourer struggled and writhed in pain, pummeled by the sheer sound waves of the flutes, it used its stinger tail to lash out at Zane, wrecking the ultrasonic raider and ripping off part of his artificial skin, exposing Zane's robotic circuitry beneath. But with the Devourer slowed but not stopped, our heroes had no choice but to retreat and regroup, allowing the dreaded serpent to tunnel through the subways of Ninjago City in a cataclysmic event, the Day of the Devourer one that would shape the future of Ninjago for years to come. Bursting forth from the ground itself, the Great Devourer rampaged through the city in a terrible attack, bringing down buildings with crushing blows. As reporter Gale Gossip took to the streets to warn the people of Ninjago City to evacuate, the Devourer continued its rampage, slowly working its way up to even the tallest skyscrapers. And on this fateful day, a child, Harumi, was playing with her ninja toys as her parents watched the news when the building itself began to rumble and shake. As emergency evacuation warnings blasted on the TV too late, Harumi watched in horror as the sun was blotted out by the mottled skin of a massive serpent coiled around the very walls of their apartment. Swept off the ground by her parents, Harumi and her family rushed to the nearest emergency exit staircase, only to find it completely blocked off, destroyed by the devourer. Panicked, the family made their way to the elevator, only to find it was full of terrified citizens already. Blocking the elevator doors, Harumi's father pushed her inside. As Harumi begged and pleaded with her parents to stay, she managed to grab her mother's hand for an instant. Right before the elevator doors slammed shut, Harumi was whisked to safety, and her parents were left on the crumbling building, crushed by the devourer. The ninja soon arrived on the scene in the ultrasonic raider, but far too late, for the damage was done and countless lives had been lost. Just as the Devourer was about to consume Ed and Edna in their jalopy, Jay leapt onto the scene, firing dazzling bursts of lightning at the foul beast as Kai sent waves of scorching fire at the serpent. As news crews filmed on, Cole hurled cars at the Devourer with the strength of Earth while Zane attempted to freeze the stinger tail solid, all four ninja firing on all cylinders to slow the beast. Meanwhile, far across the realm, Garmadon had made his way to his old ally Mistake, turncoat Oni from the First Wars. 
asking her for traveler's tea, Garmadon was prepared to leave Ninjago and return to the Realm of Madness when he noticed the desperate battle against the Devourer in Ninjago City playing on TV, and realized that without him, the Ninja, the Realm, and most importantly, his son, were all likely doomed. And back in Ninjago City, even when Samurai X joined the fray with Lloyd in tow, they were no match for the colossal power of the Serpent, seizing the mech and threatening to devour both Mia and Lloyd along with it. Powerless on the ground alone, the ninja could only watch as Samurai X came closer and closer to being devoured, until a deafening bellow ringed forth from the skies, and swooping down through the clouds to turn the tide, the mighty Ultra Dragon appeared. Wielding the powers of ice, fire, lightning, and earth, this Ultra Dragon was the combination of the ninja's all four previous steeds, who had undergone a metamorphosis in the mysterious spirit caves, combining into one ultimate creature. A steed truly bred for the Green Ninja, the Ultra Dragon put up the best fight against the Devourer yet, swooping in to strike the Serpent from all angles while battering it with the power of the elements. But this temporary advantage was not to last, for striking from behind, the Devourer crippled the Ultra Dragon, beating it out of the sky with its tail and sending the majestic beast plummeting to the ground. As the ninja rushed to ensure their dragon was still okay, Lloyd was the only one to notice his father, Garmadon, solemnly arrive on the scene. Demanding that the ninja give him their golden weapons to destroy the Devourer, Garmadon explained that it was the only way to defeat the terrible serpent. And Kai, who had once been the most suspicious of Garmadon, overcame his pride and was the first to give up his sword of fire, realizing they had no other choice. In that instant, Garmadon fulfilled his goal, claiming all four golden weapons in each hand, but his thoughts were focused on stopping the Devourer and ensuring his son was safe, and he rushed off to do his part in defeating the Serpent, bidding the ninja to keep the Devourer in one spot. And so, Kai, Jay, Zane, and Cole rushed off for the fight of their lives. Baiting the Devourer one by one and looping it around buildings and roads, the ninja used all their skills and tools at their disposal to distract the Devourer, Zane firing blasts of ice from his chest to form escape routes, while Jay hovered in midair with the power of his lightning-infused true potential. Sending the serpent winding through tunnels, archways, and passageways, up and down buildings and through roads, the ninja fought like they'd never fought before, and when they were finished, the Devourer was stuck in a loop, biting its own tail and attempting to devour itself. And as the ninja fled on the Ultra Dragon, all they could do now was watch. As the skies darkened, crackling purple energy filled the air, Garmadon appeared on the tallest tower, golden weapons ablaze with light. Finally, Garmadon could take his revenge on the being responsible for his Oni side taking control, the serpent indirectly responsible for so much harm and pain in the realm. Leaping fearlessly off the side of the building, Garmadon plummeted towards the serpent, cackling as he proclaimed vengeance was his. And in an instant, he struck the Devourer right on its weak spot, ripping the great serpent to shreds in a massive explosion that sent its venom cascading over the entire city. And in the aftermath, the Devourer and Garmadon had vanished. As the sun rose in a new day in the city, the realm was finally at peace. In the wake of the Devourer's destruction, all beings and objects it had devoured were strewn about the city, including Sensei Wu, who had miraculously survived, and rushed to greet his ninja team, who were overjoyed to find their Sensei alive and well. But, unbeknownst to the ninja, Pythor had also survived. Skin now bleached a pale white due to the acids of the Devourer's belly, Pythor slithered off, biding his time in the darkness and healing. This foe would prove to be a thorn in the ninja's side for years to come, but Pythor's revenge and his further dastardly deeds are tales for another day. And as the ninja celebrated the defeat of the Devourer, emergency crews swept throughout the city, searching for survivors among the wreckage. In the rubble, an ambulance uncovered the young Harumi, rendered catatonic from the trauma. In a single day, Harumi had lost her home and her parents, and her beloved heroes, the ninja, were to blame for failing to stop the Devourer on time. The only person who had destroyed the Devourer and saved the city in her eyes was Lord Garmadon, and as the years passed, Harumi would grow to revere the Dark Lord in a twisted sense of gratitude for saving the city, desperate to hurt the ninja the same way her world was torn apart on that fateful day. In the aftermath, Harumi, now an orphan, was adopted by the Emperor and Empress of Ninjago, 
but she remained cold and distant, never growing close to her new parents or becoming accustomed to her new life as princess, still consumed with thoughts of revenge on the ninja. But Harubi was still but a child, and it would be many years until her plans came to fruition, and her story is yet to come. And with that, thus ends Chapter 2 of Ninjago Retold, Rise of the Serpentine. Tune in next time for Chapter 3, Legacy of the Green Ninja. Alright, and with that, we have summed up Episode 2 of Ninjago Retold, Rise of the Serpentine. Stay tuned for Episode 3 coming out very, very soon, Legacy of the Green Ninja. And do let me know down in the comments below, what did you think? Did you like this? Did you dislike it? And do you have any questions about the timeline cover? Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate the support. And if you could like and subscribe, be sure to be notified of any new episodes releasing very soon. Stay tuned to Duck Breaks or even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Bye-bye for now.